The SS Meteor launched on April 25th, 1896. So this year we are actually celebrating 125 years of her launch. She was number 36 of 44 whalebacks. Um, she started as the Frank Rockefeller, then sailed as the SS uh, South Park, and now um, sailed as the SS Meteor. So that is why um, she is birthed as the SS Meteor, as that is the configuration that everybody does tour. So you can see here in the picture, that is the inside of what a whaleback looked like. The reason why it was called the whaleback is because it ran um, really low in the water. But as you can tell from the design here, it actually kind of looks like the um, ribs of a whale. So the SS Meteor was featured on the Splice, which is our local PBS station um, production that they do. So I'm going to share this video that gives you a brief little insight into the SS Meteor. My name is Sarah. The Meteor was launched back in 1896, and her first purpose was hauling iron ore. The whaleback design was pretty unique. The creator, Alexander McDougall, wanted very little freeboard or ship showing. He thought that having more of the ship under the water would be, make it more stable. The trouble with having low freeboard is you have ice on the deck for a good portion of the spring and the fall and the winter. Depending what the Meteor was hauling, there were 27 to 32 men on board. The meteor was retired in 1969. People here in Superior heard that she might get trapped. They're like, hey, she's the last whale back. we got to do something with her. One of the most fascinating parts of the entire steam plant is still intact. You have the boilers still hooked up to the main engine. As far as navigation, we think this is the original compass. We're on a steel ship hauling iron ore using a magnetic compass. Nothing can go wrong. Would you guys like to hear the horn? work weekend. That is really what has preserved the SS Meteor. So we're going on year 16, 17. I can't remember exactly offhand, but it is a collaboration between Superior Public Museum and the Great Lakes Shipwreck and Preservation Society, so GLSTS. And we also have some other organizations involved as well, some other diving organizations in the city of Superior. So in 2019, um, Ryan McGivern with the Duluth Film Company came and filmed um, our work weekend and it is a great insight into all the preservation work that has been done to help us celebrate 125 years of the SS Meteor. So we'll, this is about 11 minutes long. It's an exceptional film. It was actually up for an award um, at a film festival this spring, I believe it was. Well, I 
As you can see, the work weekend is quite intense. So some of the projects that we have worked on are obviously painting, repairing a lot of the holes. So we have um, a lot of probably about 40 to 50 people that come. Um, our, my biggest project since I've taken over as a director has been to really improve the air quality on the meteor, just because it does, you know, it's sitting there, it's not sailing. So really working on mold mitigation, taking out <laughs> items that have um, been on there for a long time that are not related to the meteor um, to help with that air quality. Um, we've been working hard on updating exhibits. Our plan is to really talk more about the different captains that the ship had, the work crew, talking more about the shipyard, Alexander McDougall and his um, life here in the Twin Ports. We've also been working hard to get the engine back up and running. It was actually not that long ago that it was running during tours. So we've been updating electrical to allow for that and also we're going to be working on um, some work with the engine to hopefully in the next year to get that up and running. With our anniversary, our big project as well is to fundraise for putting covers on the lifeboats. As you can imagine, the pigeons like the lifeboats a little bit. Even though they're not original to the ship, it really shows what the purpose of the boat deck was. So we're going to be working on that too. Um, and just really repainting as we go along and doing some more welding, opening up some more areas as well. One thing I'd really like to do, it's kind of on my future plan, maybe try it out next summer, hopefully, is that since the Meteor was not a two-pot theater ship, there's um, whatever the um, captains and officers ate, the crew ate. And we actually have all of those menus. So we thought it would be fun to do some private rentals where people could enjoy a meal catered on there of what the crew would have ate when they are out sailing. So you could pick between breakfast, dinner, or lunch. So um, those are just some fun things coming up for the meteor. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit more um, about McDougall himself, because he was actually quite the character, if you don't know anything um, about him. So he was born on March 15th in 1845 in Scotland. Um, and he passed away on March 27th in 1923 in his home in Duluth. So as mentioned in the video, he came over to the U.S. Um, at the age of nine. So we actually have his original papers, which is pretty awesome to have those. So we'll eventually get copies of those out on exhibit. We have his discharge papers, or we also have, well, we have some discharge papers for the Coast Guard. We also have... Um, some other paperwork of the Cleveland Tinkers for some purchase orders. So there's so many items that we have in archive that we've finally been able to organize a bit that we really want to get out on exhibit for everybody. Some other cool history of McDougall is this was actually McDougall's first home. Um, and you can see here on the porch is his grandmother McDougall. And if you don't know, McDougall actually had a special pet that did sail with him. Right here in this little bird cage, it was his parrot. It was a gift to him. He actually traveled with him to Everett and back and forth several times to and from Duluth. And he actually ended up residing at what is now the Lake Superior Zoo. So if you don't know the Lake Superior Zoo, it was the Duluth Zoo. It does have quite the history itself with some animals and how it started. So it's pretty cool that Alexander McDougall's little pet parrot was part of that as well. So in the home, this is a photo of what the interior of the house did look like. And the dining room here as well. And this is actually McDougall's final home. This was built after he was actually widowed. Um, so he moved across over into Duluth and resided in this home. Um, it is still there, it's privately owned. We did tour it a couple of years ago for McDougall's dream. Um, and he passed away in this home, and the story is that at the time of his passing, there was a whaleback horn that 
sounded in the Superior Bay. So pretty fitting for Alexander McDougall. So if you have not toured the Meteor, if you'd like to tour it and see a little bit of the updates, if you haven't been there in a while, you can just search on YouTube for Superior Public Museum, and the video here will show up um, of a tour from that you would see if you were in person. So make sure to check that out. It's about 25 minutes long, so I won't be showing it. Um, it gives you even more insight into the meteor if you haven't been able to visit her at all. So again, just Google um, Superior Public Museums on YouTube. There are also some fantastic books. Um, Neil Zoss is actually very involved with our work weekend. We have two of his books. Um, Roger Cullen is very involved as well. And then this past McDougall Dream event, we actually had Denise Ohio talk about the curious taste of the city of Everett. We do have her books for sale as well, and we're happy to ship them. If you have not ever looked up the um, city of Everett whaleback, it is one of the most fascinating whalebacks I feel out of all of them. Um, I did have the privilege of going to Everett, Washington when I was in Seattle a few years ago and checking out Everett, Washington. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to check out the library where everything is, but saw some of his other shipyard area out there too. Um, and then too, the Manitowoc Museum actually has artifacts from the Christopher Columbus, the passenger whaleback that he built for the Chicago World's Fair. And if you ever visit Fairlawn Mansion, we have the um, model of the SS Superior, which would have been McDougall's other passenger whaleback. They have both of that for the and, um, It actually was never built. Um, he lost funding due to a crash with the market. So, and then of course, shortly after the sinking of the Titanic. So a passenger ship was a little difficult to do at that time, but we have the model um, up on the third floor of Fairlawn. So you can visit Fairlawn as well and learn a bit, little bit more of the history of the whaleback. So as I mentioned, the meteor celebrated her 125th year launch. So we are going to have a little celebration on August 19th coming up here. We'll have free tours. Um, we're going to have some food, some other activities as well. Um, we're hoping to potentially open up the bar that was put on the Meteor back in the 70s and have some local brews available for people to enjoy. So just watch for some updates there. Um, and if you're not able to attend, we're going to have a, a fundraising page that you can help fund for our um, reopening of the triple expansion engine, as well as our lifeboat covers. And then we also have McDougall's Dream. I'm sure some of you have participated in that before, but that's going to be returning again on September 25th. And as of now, it will be in person, but we're hoping to do a hybrid. So if you're not able to attend in person, we'll be able to show the meeting up on Zoom as well. Um, I'm part of Rotary, so we have an OWL, so we'll be able to do some fun um, hybrid stuff that way. Um, another huge project is we're working to get the media as part of the um, national site through the um, United States Parks Department. So it would be on the same level as many Franklin Wright homes, our national parks, um, many other historical sites about. So it would be the highest honor that she'd be able to receive. So we're still in the process of doing that. It's quite a big process, so funding is always um, what we're working towards. But we feel that she does deserve to be on that status since the New Year's the very last whale back, as we all know, and she has the most unique history of, I feel, you know, all the ships out there. Just watching her ride in the water is very interesting. It's like a hybrid of a ship and a submarine. <laughs> so that'd be quite interesting working on them, that's for sure. Um, so like I said, short presentation, and I apologize for all the technical issues. You think, you know, by now I'd have it all solved, but obviously not. So um, please let me know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer them.
All right, thanks, Megan. That was really interesting. I didn't know that um, McDougal had a parrot that traveled with him, yep. among other things. But I, I actually have connections at the Lake Superior Zoo um, as I used to work there, so I'm going to see if they have any more details on it because they do have documentation on some of the more known animals like Bessie the elephant and uh oh gosh, I can't remember what he was, but he has a big musk. I don't know. Some odd animal has a big history too. So I'm <laughs> curious if they know anything about McDougal's parrot. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes uh, before we start answering questions, and I just want to uh, go through some of our information about our uh, visitor centers here. So, as uh, we mentioned before, uh, both of our visitor centers are open. Uh, the one in Duluth is open Thursday through Monday, closed Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We're open from 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. and masks are required in our facility. We've also got cell phone tours and virtual tours and our gift shop is open outside. At the Sioux Locks Visitor Center in Sioux Ste. Marie, Michigan, they, the Park Visitor Center and Viewing Platform are also open from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m. and masks are required for unvaccinated guests. They also have a special event on Wednesdays called Music in the Park at seven o'clock. And I'm also going to show our uh, all of our information links and everything. Uh, again, next week we will be joined by Lee Murdoch, who's a Great Lakes singer and storyteller. He will be uh, entertaining us next, or not, excuse me, on August 19th for our next program. Uh, we've also got the web pages for all of our, for our Detroit district, uh, USACE and uh, our cooperating association, LSMMA, and Facebook links for all of those, and the YouTube link where you will find all of our uh, recorded programs. And if you are interested in joining our email list for to be informed of upcoming programs, please send a uh, an email to hello lsmvc at gmail.com. Okay, and now we can get to some questions. All right, Megan, the first question, how many whalebacks sink compared to how many were scrapped at the end of their service lives? How does this ratio compare to regular ship designs on the Great Lakes? I don't know the exact number. I actually texted our collections manager to see if she remembered, because I know we talked about this um, not that long ago. Um, I would say somewhere around a dozen, but hopefully I'll get confirmation um, before this is over. Um, the McDougal had designed in his whaleback a double hull. So he had um, in the first or um, the first level, it was um, a section where if there was any damage to her hull, it would collect ballast water, which would stop it from shaking. It was double bottom. Sorry, he had, he had the double bottom design. So the theory was, again, as I mentioned, if the hull was damaged, that was still with ballast water and it would stop the whale back from shipping. Obviously, that flawed um, several times because there was um, shipwreck. Um, again, Maggie just responded, and they think many, I don't know if we've done an exact count in quite some time. However, um, one of the ones we are actually really close to in Superior is Thomas Wilson that thing just outside in the, Duluth, in the harbor there. And if you go to Canal Park, right along the water there before you start walking um, up to the um, lighthouse set there, there are some anchors there. And the triangle looking one that's laying on the ground actually belonged to the Wilson. Obviously there were some that were quite famous um, the Wilson was one since it was right here, and also the um, Everett, because that is such an interesting story with the, going down in the Gulf of Mexico um, and how that all um, happened. So that was quite interesting, and that's never been located actually. Mm -hmm. So 
sorry if you can hear my dog groaning in the background. <laughs> Megan, what's your background? How did you get interested in uh, the meteor working for the museums? Yeah, so my background is actually in recreation management. So I went to UW Cross for that. So I worked um, well over 10 years in parks and recreation, um, but I've always had an interest in historic places. It's always been something really fascinating to me. So when I was actually in Middleton, Wisconsin, um, we were we had a um, conference we had to go to in Houston, Texas. So my coworker and I decided that we were gonna play hooky for an afternoon and go do some touristy things since we didn't know when we would be back in Houston. And we went and checked out the SS um, Texas down there. And my coworker was very interested in the battleship. So he told me a lot about it. And that was my first like big experience with a big vessel like that and that it was Really, really fascinated. So my husband actually got a job up at UW Superior. So when we officially moved up here, I said, well, I'm here. I wanted to be um, really involved in the community, and I wanted to finally take the time to volunteer and work at historic sites. So I started as a volunteer tour guide with Superior Public Museum. So my second summer, um, my first summer I did tours at Fairlawn. Second summer I did them on the meteor. Um, and then when Sarah Blank, the previous director, resigned. I applied for the position in the meantime as the events coordinator at the Lake Superior Zoo um, and got the job. So that's kind of in a roundabout way how I came um, to the museum. My background is much more in program planning, budgeting, things like that. But um, mm -hmm. I just fell in love with the site and fell in love with the media. <laughs> Nice. And in turn, you probably became a little bit of a boat nerd. Yes, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Comes with the job. Uh, what is the I'm most challenging? I'm trying to turn my three-year-old into a boat nerd, too. <laughs> I quiz him daily when we're in the, over in Duluth and everything. What's that ship over there? And he goes, meteor. And I ask him, what is it? And he said, whale well, Oh, nice. Get them while they're young. <laughs> Another question came in. What is the most challenging thing about preserving the ship in addition to fundraising? Yep. So it's metal. It rusts. That's the biggest challenge and the fact that it sits um, on man-made island. So, so far the hull, from observations that we've done and inspections, the hull is intact. But because of it sitting right on the water there and the rising levels and, you know, gales in November and all that, um, we do get water inside that flows in. And just because it's not temperature controlled, um, the freezing and thawing of the land as well, because of how it sits in there, is causing the, um, the where the um, rudder is to start um, shifting, so that's causing some cracking um, up in the quarters. So those are, you know, by far the biggest challenges that we have. I mean, ultimately, it'd be cool to fully lift it out, but, you know, that's several million dollars um, to do that. So, um, yeah, that's, those are definitely the biggest challenges are Mother Nature, like everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. When is the museum open and how much of the ship is the public able to see? Like the engine room yeah. holds crew quarters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the meteor is open May through October. So about mid-May through mid-October. Um, biggest thing is obviously weather dependent. And then, um, so during the summer it's open daily. And we also have night tours from 4.30 to 8.30 during the week. Um, because it's a little bit cooler during that time. Um, and then I would say probably about, you walk through about 50% of the ship, um, but you get to see more. So you can obviously see the engine. You're not able to go um, to the top of the engine room and look down or underneath it, but you still get a very good view of the engine room. The boilers, um, you can see the boilers, but you're not obviously allowed to walk down into the boiler room just because so much of it is still original to when it um, did fail, um, that it's for safety reasons, <laughs> you can't um, walk down there, but you still get a very good view. 
you do get to walk through some of the cargo holds as well, which is really cool. And we have an exhibit, so if you're not able to take the walking tour, since it is not ADA accessible, you know, ladders. <laughs> so um, we do have a fantastic exhibit that you can walk through as well. Another part we're hoping to potentially have done by September 19th, or August 19th, I apologize, is have a media room. So showing you some of the videos that you showed today and showing our other tours so people that are not able to take the walking tour can actually feel like they're still visually seeing um, the media. But you get to see a, a really good chunk of her. Nice. Do you have a favorite part or object in the media that you like? Yeah. Um, I love the tad birds. They're super fun for some reason. Obviously, blowing the original horn is pretty darn cool. But for I really like um, the galley and the dining hall. Those are probably my favorite, just because they, we still have a lot of the original pieces in there, like the TV. So you you really get um, a view of what the life was like on the meteor. Nice. Another question. Do you have to do a lot of mitigation or monitoring for lead and asbestos on board? Those are pretty common materials in ship construction in the past. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why some of those sections are closed off because they haven't had those mitigations yet, but I'm working with the city um, to continue um, that project. But obviously during work weekend and all that, when we're removing paint and doing new paint, we have all the protective gear that we have to wear um, and everything to avoid any um, exposure to that. So, yep, it's it's a big project. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Was the Meteor ever equipped with radio communication equipment? And if so, is it still installed and on display? Yes. So, the um, pilot house was redone in the 20s. Um, and then shortly after that, especially during the 40s, they had more radio communication. Um, so anything that they first started with for navigational units, communication and all that are are still there. Not Most are original. Um, and then, because they never removed any of the original stuff because things weren't very reliable, so they always wanted to make sure they had a backup. So we still have the radio, um, the phones, the directional finders, all that kind of stuff. So anything that the meteor had for communication purposes um, is still in the pilot house and the chart room. Okay. Do you still get donations from people about, or from, of donations of items that were on the meteor? Not as much anymore. Um, I think most people like actual items, not so much anymore, but we actually do get quite a few still picture donations. Um, and we still have people saying, you know, this relative of mine was as a crew on here. So it's more so pictures and stories that we get than actual um, meteor artifacts. Okay. Nice. So we pretty much, whatever the ship came with, stayed. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, well, we've got a few more minutes. If anyone has any uh, last minute questions you want to submit through the chat. Otherwise, uh, please join us again on August 19th for our next program. We've got Lee Murdoch, Great Lakes singer, storyteller, entertaining us for an hour. And Megan, thank you so much for uh, presenting for us today. We appreciate the, the uh, little change of pace and have um, some information about whalebacks, which we haven't really had in our in our virtual programs before. So that's that was really interesting, and uh, it's always nice to have you know collaborate with other people, other people in the maritime industry. So again, we appreciate you presenting for us today, and I don't see any further questions. So um, we will we will close this. This segment here and again thank you everyone for attending today hope you enjoyed it and please join us again in two weeks on August 19th and in the meantime stay healthy and take care
thank you everyone.